right, so welcome everyone to uh, Best Practices for Spreadsheet Modeling, Data Shaping, and Data Analysis. Man, that's a big, long title. Um, so my name's Ken Pulse. Uh, I'm going to be starting off the presentation. I've got David and Roy with me from Microsoft here as well. Um, he's going to be showing you some really cool stuff uh, with some dynamic arrays and some other funky stuff a little bit later on. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to start, I want to talk a little bit about stuff that's not strictly new, but is uh, really important for actually building proper business intelligence in Excel. We're going to take a look at Power Query, we're going to look at the data model, and we're going to start before we do that by just quickly reviewing some dimensional modeling terms, because these are kind of important once you start pushing past the boundaries of a standard pivot table and getting into Power Pivot, where we start linking multiple dimensions together. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, this little frame here. Uh, how many of you are pivot table users? How many of you guys have actually started jumping into Power Pivot as well? Fair enough. How many of you guys have ended up causing relationship problems? You can't figure out what the heck is going on? <laughs> That's almost the same hands. That's interesting. All right, fair enough. Uh, so you're probably familiar with this little dialogue that you see right here. This is the Pivot Table Wizard. I like to um, sort of uh, break this down into four areas. The most important one is the area in the bottom right-hand corner is going to be the one that's featured uh, mostly centered here. But the key thing that is really cool about Pivot Tables is that they've actually allowed us as uh, Excel users to really shell ourselves away from dimensional modeling terms for a long time. It just did a lot of stuff for us really, really easily. And we didn't actually need to know what these two words at the top of the screen actually stand for. Facts and dimensions. What, what are those? So the key thing is, is that as you start moving into PowerPoint, you need to know this stuff. This becomes important. The terminology and also the way that we put it all together matters. So the deal with facts is that facts get aggregated. This is all about taking multiple values and trying to turn them into a single value so that we can return them to the cell. So we're taking multiple rows and we're doing things like um, maybe summing them up to get sum of sales or maybe counting them to get a count of products. Dimensions are how we slice our facts. And the key thing that we're looking for here is the keyword by. When I want to see my sum of sales by customer, by account group, by day, by month, by year, that would mean that I'm actually now talking about a dimension. The dimension is all about how the slides are or facts are actually sliced up. So by account group, by customer class, by year, month, or day. The question is, when you're actually looking at this, how do you identify which are which when you're actually looking at the pivot table and looking at the other pieces? And the answer is, it's actually super, super easy. It's all based on where they live inside this little diagram. Facts live in the bottom right-hand corner. If it lives in the bottom right-hand corner, if it's a fact. If it doesn't, it's a dimension. And that's basically the way the rule goes. It's actually not that hard once you actually recognize what it is. If you intend to take that field and drag it into the bottom right-hand corner of a pivot table, it's a fact. Because you're going to count it, sum it, standard deviation it, average it, whatever you're going to do to it. If it's going to go into another field, rows, columns, filters, slicers, timelines to slice it up, it's a dimensional field. Okay? Now, so there's the two, uh, two little rules here. And this, uh, this slide deck is actually posted online on the site, right? So you can actually download these slides later if you want to get higher resolution pictures than what your phone's taking. That's totally cool. Um, why do you even care about this stuff? Why, why does it matter about the facts and dimensions at all? And it's because these two things should actually live in completely separate tables when you're building a proper dimensional model. And if you follow this rule, it's going to save you an awful lot of headaches. This is the number one problem I see when somebody brings me a dimensional model and it's not working, is that generally what they're doing is they're grabbing dimensions from a fact table, throwing them into the pivot table, and then we're trying to figure out why it's not slicing properly. Now, there's a couple of other things you want to know about just as well with, uh, with structures here. Um, fact tables, when you're trying to build one, they contain the columns which need to be aggregated. Uh, these could be numeric, they could be text, doesn't matter, because sometimes we count some things that we want. They also contain foreign key columns. These are columns that have multiple different values in them that we use to link to the dimensional tables. Okay? Um, they contain many repeating values. The big key thing I want you to remember about this is that once you've actually got a field that you're going to drag into the bottom right-hand corner of a pivot table, that makes it a fact table. You should never be using one of those fields to slice your rows and your columns and things like that, which is exactly what the old pivot table used to encourage you to do because there was only one table. So if that's what a fact table needs to look like, what does a dimensional table need to look like? It's slightly different. It contains a primary key column. This is a unique identifier, something like customer ID. We would never have multiple customer IDs in the customer's table because the whole point of it is to have a unique list of every customer we have. This will contain unique values for every single row of the table. They also have, and it's also actually the one that we use to link back to, the foreign key column inside the fact table. 
The other kind of columns that we have in this table are what we call the dimensional columns. These are the columns that we actually use to slice things. So when you look at a, a customer table, for example, it has a unique customer ID, you might have many first names where the first name is John. You might have many, many times when somebody lives in Georgia or when they live in Canada or when they live somewhere else. So lots of repeating values in those areas. But these are the fields we use to slice the facts up. Okay? So lots of different ones there. Most of the time these are text, but not always. Sometimes they can be numeric as well. These are all sort of rules that have potential permutations sometimes. The key thing that we want to remember is that if we have a dimensional table, if we built one of these up, we never want to drag one of those fields into the bottom right-hand corner of a pivot. As soon as we do, it becomes a fact table, and those extra fields should not be on that table at all. Once we've got our tables built correctly, we need to talk a little bit about relationship schemas. What are these? Well, for those of you who work with Power Pivot, you know you take two tables, you drag fields from one to the other, and everything links up, and it's always beautiful. It always works perfectly the first time. Okay or not, right? Fair enough. So what kind of a relationship schemas do we use? The first one we're looking for, this is the ideal schema, is awesome, is called a star schema. What does that mean? It means you've got one fact table and you've got several dimensional tables that are linked to that fact table. Okay? But the key thing about a star schema is that there is one level of dimensions around the fact and only one level. There can be four of them, there can be two of them, there can be one uh, dimension, there can be 90 dimensions, it doesn't matter, but there's only one, one level. As soon as you get past one level, you move into this thing that we call a snowflake. This is where we have one fact table and multiple levels of dimensional fields. They look like this. Why is it called a snowflake? Because if you ever looked at a snowflake under the microscope, every single one of them is unique. They've got lots of branches going all over the heck, all over the place. But ideally, this is not what we want to see. What makes this a snowflake? These fields here. It's an extra level of dimension. Key thing is, we don't need that. If we actually flatten these things down, we know there's a one-to-many relationship between all these tables, uh, the, all the yellow ones and the blue ones, so we could actually flatten them down to get back to the star schema, which is ideal for what we actually need to do. There are some exceptions to this, and this is where we start moving into more complicated models. And this is my personal favorite. It's called the Galaxy or Facts Constellation. What the heck is that? That's where we actually take multiple fact tables and we link them through common dimensions. And this right here is why Power Pivot is like my serious best friend next to Power Query, because this allows me to solve the unvelookable problem where I can't flatten tables down to put them in pivot tables. This right here is what changed my entire career to where, you know, I just fly around the world teaching people how to do this kind of stuff rather than actually having to work for a real job. Okay? You guys don't want to do that though, because that's competition to me, right? But hey, um, anyhow. This is what we're looking for ideally when we start linking multiple facts. It gives us the ability to start comparing actuals versus budgets even though they're in completely separate tables and may not line up. So the trick with all this stuff is how do you take a model that has problems where you can't relate it and actually get it into one of these formats? And that's what I'm going to look at now with some recipes and for some demos for how to actually put all this stuff together. So we're going to look at a model that, uh, that I have here which is not built very well at this point in time. Um, and we're going to go and we're going to change it up and I'm going to show you what the problems are here so that we can actually fix it and actually be able to slice the way we want. So the first one that I want to look at is a specific issue that we run into where we have a many-to-many -many join problem. So we're trying to link two tables together. How many of you have seen this? You try and link two tables together, it brings you back the message that says you can't do that because there's multiple distinct values in each, in each table. You guys seen that before? All right. So there's an answer for dealing with this. Here's one. We've got sales, we've got budgets. And right here, we have a relationship that we cannot make between sales and budgets because we've got multiple repeating. We've got beer one side or beer one side, or it's repeating many times in the sales table, many times in the budgets table. So if I try and drag that line between those two, it's just not going to work. So the answer to this is that we actually use a separate table called a bridge table where we would go and create a unique list of categories that we can then link to both tables. This then gives us the ability to go and actually slice both tables using one slicer or put this field onto rows or columns or whichever we want to do in order to make it work. Now there's a recipe for doing this stuff if you don't have the ability to go and actually grab your bridge table from your database. And this is a reality for a lot of us is that we get a couple of fact tables that are sent our way. Sometimes they come from a text file and an Excel file, so IT is not helping us out. So we don't have that unique table of what we need. So we can build one on the fly using my favorite tool, Power Query. So the recipe for dealing with this, what we do is we create what I call a staging query for each of our tables. We're talking each sales and budgets here. I'm going to reference sales to start with. I'm going to go right click on the category column, say remove other columns. I'm going to right click and remove duplicates. That should leave me with a list, if I was looking at this data, of beer wine cider. And I'm going to load that as a connection only query. What does that mean? It doesn't get loaded to a table. It doesn't get loaded to the data model. It's just ready to be called when I need it later on. 
I'm then going to go back and do the exact same thing for the budgets table. So I'll have two individual tables that have three rows each at this point. Once I've done that, I'm going to reference these two guys together and append them so that I now get a new table that has beer wine cider, beer wine cider. And then I'm going to remove the duplicates. And that one, I'm going to load to the data model. Why do I do this? Because it enforces referential integrity. So that if somebody adds liquor to one table and spirits to another, I'm not going to have orphaned records that don't line up. I will make sure that I have all of them so that nothing is ever missed. Okay? So because Power BI and, and Excel's uh, Power Pivot doesn't enforce referential integrity, we've got to take it in our own, own hands to do our own job here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a little model that I have right here. And so far, it looks pretty good. I'm, I'm happy. I've got a nice little chart. and It's slicing up nicely. At least it looks like it. And I'm going to break it down by one of my locations here. So I'm going to go and uh, um, click on gelato, which is a type of monkey, just for reference. Uh, now, it looks like it's sliced. Everything looks all good, except that if you look really carefully at the budget here, it's $23,500. And when I go to Howler, it's $23,500. And when I clear the filter, it's still $23,500. So I'm slicing my my sales table really well. That one's changing constantly, down to 29, we're up to 25, back up to, to uh, oh, sorry, clear that off, we're back up to 54, everything's working great. But unfortunately, why is the budget not slicing? And it has to do with the way that this was actually put together. So if I click on this, how many of you are big fans of the references may be needed or relationship may be needed? Oh, thumbs down, wow, okay, that hurts. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of this either. Uh, these, the nice little auto detect button here isn't gonna help me. Okay, that's one of the other challenges that I have here. Um, so I need to go and actually figure out what's going on. This slicer has actually been pulled uh, using the location field from the sales table. This is, because it has a measure on it, a fact table. So we've actually taken something, put it in a slicer. It's a dimension that's come from a fact table. This is why, we, one of the reasons we're seeing this relationship maybe needed error here. So I need to fix this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the data that's actually driving this model. Actually, first off, let me just show you in Power Pivot what we've got. So if I take a look here, you can see that this is my model right now. So I've got a divisions table that's linked nicely into my accounts table. That's great. Categories is linked nicely into my accounts table. Categories linked to my budgets. That's all good. Uh, but my sales table is not linked very well. And I need, really need this one, location to link to location. And when I try this, it's obviously not going to do very well at all because there's multiple values on both sides. In addition, we'll see this a little bit later, I also need to link these two guys together and it's not going to work either, so we're going to solve that problem in a little bit as well. If I take a look at the source data, it's all here just for convenience sake. So I've got a nice little chart of accounts, I've got an actual sales table, a budgets table, categories and divisional table here, and I've loaded all of this data into the data model directly through Power Query. One of the things I refuse to do is link an, uh, a, an Excel table directly into the data model. I always want control so that I can modify it and change it should I need to if the needs evolve for the project. Now, what I'm going to look at is I'm going to go and say, well, let's take a look at the sales table for a second. So we'll just double click on it and we'll jump inside. And you can see, and I'll just bigify this to make it nice and obvious here. You can see that we've got this nice little column here for all of my locations. And what I'm going to do with it right now is I'm going to say, well, that's great, but I'd like to right click and I'd like to reference this guy right here. And I'm going to make a new little table here, which is called staging dash sales locations. And in this table, I'm going to move it into my staging queries group that I have up here. I'm going to uh, go and say right click on location, remove other columns, right click. We're going to remove the duplicates and I'm now left with just my two unique locations. Now that's great. That's based on the sales table. I also need one based on the budgets table over here, so I'll do the same thing. Right click and reference, and we're going to go and we're going to rename this one here. We'll call this one staging dash budget locations. I'm going to try and type nicely. It's almost impossible for me. There we are. Budget locations. We'll move to here. Right click, remove other columns. Right click, and we will remove the duplicates as well. So at this point, I've now got two short tables with the individual records from both. Does that make sense so far? Cool. I'm going to hit close and load. We're going to go back. Um, I've customized my load defaults in Power Query so that when I hit close and load, it just loads immediately into a connection-only query. I don't load to the data model. If you ever want to do that, it's actually relatively easy. Under Get Data, Query Options, you can jump into the little dialog that comes up here. And what you do is you basically come up here and say Specify Custom Load Behaviors, and you uncheck Load to Worksheet and uncheck Load to Data Model. This is super, super handy because when you're working in the Power Query interface and you load queries out, you only get to choose one destination no matter how many queries you've made inside that session. 
And if you have got several tables that have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds or thousands or millions of rows of data and you accidentally load them all to the data model, you get to wait for every single one of them to finish and then you have to go back and manually unload every one of them and it takes a lot of time. And you know, one thing we never have enough of is time. So this is easy, it's boom, it's just done. Oh right, I meant to load that one to the data model, I'll change the behavior individually. So there we go, that's how that particular part worked. Now, what can I do with this? Now that I have the staging sales locations and budgets, what I'm going to do is I'm going to append these two guys together. Uh, we can do that by right-clicking and choosing append right here. That will absolutely work. What will happen if I do that is I will get a power query that gives me one step that says append to these two tables. I'm a big fan of audit trails in my work because I like it when somebody else can open it up and see exactly what I've done. And this is why I don't actually do this. Instead, I'll go to reference. When I reference it, it brings me in a nice new query here, and it says right at the top, equals staging sales locations. If I open it up, that's this guy over here. It's wrapped it in hashtags and quotes for me because I used a dash, and it needs to escape that literal character. But I can now go and rename this and call this one locations. The key thing here, I'm going to move that down into my data model as well. The key thing here is if I had used the append feature and appended the table like I'm going to do right now, I'm going to go and say append, and we're going to grab the staging budget locations. I would have got exactly the same result as you see right here, but I would only have one step in the applied steps window. Now I have two. So this is kind of nice because I can see that, hey, I grabbed the data from somewhere, and then I took something else and stuck it on the bottom. And so somebody else can open this, and they can see exactly what I'm doing without having to read M code. How many of you guys have decided to get into the practice of actually learning what's actually under happening under the hood with Power Query, reading and digesting that M code? You guys are brave people. It's not the prettiest, most friendly looking coding language in the world, right? So I try and keep the people away from that in, if, uh, if we absolutely can. Now, at this point, I've still got duplicates in here. So I'm going to go right click. We're going to say remove duplicates. And at that point, we say, hey, that's pretty good. There's my locations. I'm going to force it to text. It's a good practice for all of your tables that are going to load to a destination that the very final step should be reapply all of the data types just in case something changes something along the way, what you never ever want is a data type that shows with an ABC123 in the top because depending on the load destination, whether it goes to an Excel table or whether it goes to Power Pivot, you can sometimes get different results. For example, a date, it may be looking like a date in here, nicely italicized and everything, but if it says ABC123 and you load it to an Excel table, you get the date serial number, and if you change the load destination to go to Power Pivot, you get text. But in neither case do you get a date, which is actually what you want. So if you force it to be a date, then it'll actually work, which is exactly what we need. So now I'm going to say close and load two, because I want this table to go into the data model. And it should, at this point, load me over here with a grand total of two exciting rows. So now, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to come back over here and say, great, I've got a nice new location table. I'm going to link that one there. I'm going to link this one over here. And then I'm going to say right click on these guys and hide. Right click on this one and hide. Uh, this is a rule I have for building a dimensional model. I actually wish I could convince the Excel team to do this by default. Um, is every time I make a relationship between these tables, I always hide the field on the many side. And the reason being is because that way, my user can't accidentally go and drag this field onto a pivot table and get into a relationship problem. It's impossible. It forces them to use the one from the dimensional table. Okay, so this is actually a really good thing because we won't run into the problem that we're actually seeing in this report where they've grabbed the slicer from completely the wrong place. So this one right now still causes the same problems that I had before because it's based on the actuals table or sales table. So I'm going to delete it. And what we're going to do instead is we'll go and select this guy here. Uh, you guys probably know that you can go to the um, pivot chart analyze tab and you can click insert slicer from here. Uh, you can also, when you're looking at your tables here, I'm going to go to all locations. I can just right click on the field right here and say add a slicer and that'll pop it up as well. So it's just another way to do it. I'm going to grab this over here. We'll snap it into the grid nicely. You hold down your alt key when you're dragging your lines to make it snap to grid. If you didn't know, it's a quick little tip. And now what you can see here is that when I actually slice this, these guys are both slicing. And my 12,500 is showing not 23 and a half thousand. There's howlers at 11,000. And when I clear it out, it's working nicely. So that's the first component here is creating a bridge table. 
Um, this is probably one of the most common problems that I see when somebody brings me a model and they're trying to figure out how to link these things together. They don't have this table on the fly. How do we do it? The number one thing that I would say is I always, I, when it, what I've seen some people do is they'll actually reference one table, remove the duplicates, and call it a day on that. I recommend you don't do that. Re do the reference to the other table as well. Append them back together and deduplicate again. And at that point, again, if somebody adds categories to one table that's not in the other, it doesn't matter which one they do, you'll always have all the values. It enforces that referential integrity. It just makes your model more sustainable over the long term. All uh, right, we did the linking dimension. So the next little challenge that we run into, this is the second most common problem I see in dimensional modeling when I'm dealing with clients, is we've got a table that looks like this and a table that looks like this. But the challenge that we have here is we've got multiple different accounts. We've got multiple different uh, repeating items in the departments table. In the chart of accounts, we have multiple repeating items. We've got multiple repeating departments. Again, how do we link these two tables together? And what this is a little bit trickier because you need to read your data and you need to understand exactly what's going on in it. But the key thing here is when we actually look at the chart of accounts, if I go and look at it really carefully and say, well, if I put the account and department together, with a delimiter in between, really important to have a delimiter. When we actually go and take a look at these in combination, this forms a unique entry. And this has many repeating entries because we have our, our transactions being posted to account combinations many, many times. One of the one, number one things I recommend you do when you're actually putting these things together is always use a delimiter. The reason for this is very, very simple. If you have products one through 11 and departments one through 11, if you put them together with no delimiter, what's one, one, one? Is it product one, department 11, or product 11, department one? You end up with a many relationship still that you can't deal with. As soon as you have that delimiter in the center, it automatically breaks those out. Now you know exactly what they are. You can even split them up later if you need to, right? Which is kind of handy. So there's a recipe for dealing with this as well. My transactions table, my fact table, it's gonna have multiple repeating items. My chart of accounts can have its unique items, so that's good. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and we're gonna build this up, and in my transactional query, uh, the one on the left here, I'm going to go to transform and merge columns. So how many of you are working with Power Query actively today? Nice. That's so cool. Um, I've been working with this long enough that I remember when no hands went up, which was, was tragic. So, um, so what happens when I do a transform merge columns? If I have three or four columns in this table right now, how many columns am I going to have left after I do this exact operation? Three is the right answer because account and department are going to get put together into a single one and it won't keep any of the other stuff around. Okay? Um, make sure you use the delimiter for that. In the dimensional query, so this is chart of accounts, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go to add column merge columns. Now, right now, there's three columns in this table. How many will I have when I'm done? Four. Because I'm not going to drop the account or the department because I might want to slice by those later. So I want to keep those things around. So I'm going to add a new one that actually gives me my account department combination. Uh, once again, we'll use a delimiter for this. Um, this is something you can also combine with the bridge tables. Sometimes we have to do this. And as I say, this is the second most common problem I see when I'm actually uh, working with clients on their dimensional models to try and figure out what went on. Um, I have that exact problem inside this model. If I take a look at this, I have accounts and I have uh, divisions here, and I have accounts and I have divisions over here. So if I take a look at the actual source data and I go back to my accounts table, you can see here's my account fields. Here's my division field. If I put these together, I've got a 61510 that shows up twice, but if I put them together, they will actually make a unique key. How do you prove that out? You do something like this. Filter to a number filter of 61510. Oh, look at that. Multiple 61510s, multiple departments. Okay, but I don't see multiple lines that say 150 or multiple lines that say 155. So I would try this, test it on a couple of different things. That one looks like it's gonna be consistent. Okay, this one as well. All right, cool. Then I would also back check it the other way. Let's remove the filter. Let's go back and say, hey, if I'm gonna go into 150, I only see a unique list of accounts. So we test it backwards and forwards. Now, for this data, I know this, and I know exactly how it's gonna work, but the key is when you're trying to link two tables and you don't know if there's a relationship, sometimes you have to play this game going back and forth to actually try and figure out what it is, okay? So now that I know that, though, this is actually gonna be pretty easy to deal with. In the old world, we'd write a formula inside Power Pivot right here, but that's not a good idea. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back over to Excel, and we're gonna take a look at Power Query, and we're gonna say, okay, so what are we gonna start with? Let's start with our transactional table sales. So I'm gonna double click on that to edit it. I'm gonna open this up. We can see that we've got account. Actually, let me just uh, bigify this again. We can see we've got account, 
and we've got division right here, so I'm going to hold down my control key, select the next one. I'm going to say right click, merge columns, and then at this point, we'll choose a separator. I always go for custom because Dash isn't a first class citizen, apparently. I'm not sure why. Uh, what's that? Uh, no, I don't need to reference it first. That's a great question. I don't need to reference this at all because I'm actually transforming the original table itself. So um, in this case, we don't need the reference. In the previous one I did, I needed to spin that off because I wouldn't want to change the original tables. That's a great question. Um, so I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to uh, go with this, LNK underscore act departments or act division. Uh, that's going to be my account division that's actually being put together. And LNK is my shortcut for uh, spelling link. Um, it saves me one letter, which I then burn on an underscore because I don't like using spaces. You decide in your, your nomenclature, all I can say is that I've never had anybody come back to me afterwards and not know what I meant. So that's good, right? Um, because one of the favorite things that I have to do with models that I build is delegate them to somebody else. That's like the best kind of work ever when you can give it away, right? Um, all right, so next up, that was my sales table. I'm now going to go to my accounts table and I'm going to transform this one too. I'm going to grab account and division. The thing is, is that division if you actually look back at the model, is already linked to division inside the divisions table over here. So I definitely don't want to burn that one up. I want to keep him around. So I'm going to grab these two guys here. And this time, I don't want to use the right click because this is a transform action doing this. I don't want to use merge columns from the transform tab. I want to use it from add columns here. We'll say merge columns. Separator, once again, custom. We'll go with the dash. And we're going to say LNK underscore ACK division. These do not need to have the same name in both tables. I just find it makes the model a lot closer to self-documenting when they actually do. So at this point, I can now go and say home. I have, actually, I should probably call this one out too. Maybe you've noticed this. Once a table's been loaded to a destination, there is absolutely no ability to change it inside Power Query. So at this point, I'm just going to hit close and load. It's going to reload it to the data model. But if you do load something to the wrong place, coming back into Power Query isn't going to help you. So if you want to change the load destination, you have to right click and choose a load to here, and that's where we would actually change it. We'll see that in a little bit as well. The key thing now is we come out of this, we go back into Power Pivot, and we go back to our diagram view. The tables have changed a little bit. I now have a link account division column between both of these, so I can drag that in. What I don't have over here is I don't have an account and I don't have a division column anymore. This is super important because those columns add me no value. If I want to slice by account or division, they belong in the dimension table, not the fact table. And by removing them, I've actually saved memory inside the model. It makes the model more efficient and it will react to slicing faster because there's less data. So this is a, a really useful thing. Um, I'm also going to, of course, hide the field on the many side. That's the star side. And I'm also going to ask myself this, is anybody ever going to slice something by a link account department? I mean, this is a composite key that I built on the fly that's written in a code that most people aren't ever going to care to read. So if they're not going to, then you know what? Why surface it to them at all? Let's just get rid of it. It doesn't clutter up their user interface. So now that I've done this, I'm going to go back to Excel, and I'm going to say, all right, cool. So if I slice this by, say, alcohol, we can see that my Items are moving between beer and wine. That's cool. If I go to food, there we go. We've got just our burgers. I can clear that one off. If I go and I slice by my locations, these guys are working. Everything looks pretty good so far. So I'm able to get into a much better state with this model. All right. The next part that, uh, that I want to look at is where we actually go back and we take a look into the Power Pivot model at something that's going on here. And it's this table right here. This is a snowflake. Right? When we actually look at it, I've got a categories table that is bridging between accounts and budgets. I've got a locations table bridging between sales and budgets. That's all good. But this guy here is a single leaf off of the top of a table. And it doesn't, uh, it's a single leaf off of a dimensional table. It's kind of a key. I would never want to actually have my division being sliced over here. But in this area, it makes sense. But why do I have this? Well, it's to get to region, because I don't have region in this particular table. So it makes sense, except that it doesn't add any value being on its own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take a look at that and see if there's anything we can do to flatten that snowflake down. And that's exactly what this particular slide here about is flattening snowflake dimensions to get them back into a star schema shape. Right? Now, when we look at these two particular tables here, this is my what I refer to my star table. The reason being, it has a star next to it. 
Okay, so if you have multiple tables through the chain, what you're doing is you, the star table is the one that has a star between the relationship that you're actually looking at. The other guy is my snowflake table, and he's the one that has the one on the side of the relationship. Okay, this is the leaf that's actually going on. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, okay. Uh, so what we're going to do in as well, and as well, and the recipe goes like this as well, and the recipe goes like this as well, and the recipe goes like this. We're going to edit the star table. Okay, so I'm not going to reference it. I'm going to edit it directly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Home, Merge Queries, and I'm going to merge it to the Snowflake table. I'm going to select the common fields for the merge. In this case, it's going to be division because that's what we're using to relate these two fields together. And then we're going to use, click OK to use the left outer join. Left outer join is the default. What that's going to do is it's going to find all the related records that are in the division table. We already know this is a one-to-many relationship, so it's never going to bring back the wrong thing. And at that point, I can expand the fields from the Snowflake table. In this case, the only field I need is region. So that should give me a table that has my account, my division, and my region all in one table, rather than actually having it spread across multiple layers. Okay. I'll load that to the data model, and then I'm going to go create my relationships, and I'll edit my Snowflake table to actually change it to connection only and remove it from the data model altogether because it serves no purpose at that point. So, oops come back to that. Uh, so once again, I'm going to go back to Power Query. If I can find Excel, that is. There it is. Awesome. And we're going to go and we're going to take a look at what we actually have going on inside of this. So when I take a look, if I double click on Accounts, that's going to take me into my account table. I'll just open that up, make it a little bigger. And here we go. So inside here, we have the division column. This was the many side of the relationship. We can see our many divisions here. And we have our divisions table, which has a unique list of divisions, but has the region in it as well. So we'll go back over to accounts and we'll say, great, let's merge this and we'll merge it to the divisions table. Now, I don't need it for this particular pattern, but just in case you ever need to merge something based on a multi-column join, uh, if you didn't know, you can actually grab two columns hold down your control key, select them. This will give you a composite key right there without actually having to create a separate table to do it, okay? Um, so that's not necessary for what I'm doing here, but it is kind of a cool trick that's not super discoverable unless someone shows you, so you know, we'll cover that. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually link from division to division. This will give us our left outer join. There's all kinds of other joins in there. We don't need them for this pattern. We'll say okay, and this now gives us a nice little column over here that has our tables in it. Um, this is one of the things that I find is interesting working with Power Query because this kind of blows the mind of a lot of Excel people the first time they see it because we're used to in Excel having a spreadsheet where every cell holds one data point and that's it. But in this cell here, these little guys here, they're green keywords. This is a more complex data item. You'll notice if I move over it, it mouses in, it gives me the finger, which is not so good. Um, basically what that tells me if I click on it, it's going to blow everything up because it's actually going to drill into that one table and I don't want that. But if you click on the white space, it'll actually give you a preview of what's actually available inside this table. So it says, hey, the regions that you found for 150 is east. If I look at that, that's east and east, this is west and then west west. I say, well, that's really cool. That's what I want. So I'm going to click this. This is the opposite of merging, okay, which is split it apart. I don't need the original column name as prefix because I don't want to call this divisions.region. And I also don't want the division because I already have it. And just like that, we can expand it. We now have it all in one table. So from here, we'll say close and load. This will load our accounts table back into the data model, which is pretty good. And then at this point, I say, well, now this divisions table, right click, load to, uncheck the box from the load or add to data model. It's going to give me a really nice warning that says, hey, um, this is connected to stuff. Are you sure you want to do this? Of course I do. There we are. And it'll remove it. Awesome. Divisions is gone. So now let's jump back into the Power Pivot model. Where are we here? And now what you'll see is that that snowflake is missing. It's gone. And we're now back to a proper star schema involved for this particular guy with account, division, and region in one table. So this is kind of nice now, too, because we're no longer in a scenario where we have multiple tables that have one item in them for actual slicing and filtering. We've got multiple fields in one area. Now, this only works if you can flatten the one-to-many join, of course. At this point, I'm going to go back, and we're going to see, did it work? Is everything still fine? And you'll notice that my slicer has disappeared. If you delete a table and there's a slicer bound to it, it's going to go away because it's to say I don't have anything left, which is actually, in my mind, kind of better than what we, uh, what we have with Excel formulas where we get a hash ref error, it just disappears. Although, I mean, you could argue where maybe that shouldn't be the case either. Now, 
I'm going to go take a look at my all over here, and I'm going to say, all right, uh, inside my accounts table, I'm going to right-click on region, and I'm going to say add a slicer. So we'll take this over here. We're going to go and slide it in. I'm going to use my Alt key to snap to grid again, and I'm going to bring it back to this point here. Actually, it feels like it could be just a little bit smaller. Beautiful. Look at that. Now, when I click on this and, and drill it, what you're going to see is that it actually slices the sales, but it does not slice the budget. Is that by design or is it not? And the answer is, if you actually look in the budget table, there's no information in the budget table whatsoever that actually tells you that we were actually budgeting by division. Okay, so we just did a, a global budget on these particular things, or we did it by location, but we didn't actually do it by division itself. Uh, in an ideal world, I'd probably try and move this around, try and get my division set up a little bit differently, but in this case, that's what's there, and that's what it's gonna be. Next problem. The next problem is this. If I go and slice into January, you'll notice that a lot of the stuff is actually moving around and it's looking pretty good, but what we're seeing right now is that my sales are not actually slicing. My budget is slicing very well, but sales is not. And the reason for this one is because this timeline, there it is still at 11,028, this timeline was actually built off of the month end field here on budget. Of course, the timeline is a dimensional field, so it's now trying to use a field from a fact table how do we know it's a fact table? Because it's got the measure on it, and it's only got relationships outbound, it's only got stars inside the model. So this is not cool, this is not gonna work for us. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and we're gonna deep, uh, de or we're gonna fix this little challenge here. And this is a specific problem that um, is actually, I gotta say, like if I look at, at my stuff and say bridge tables is the number one most encountered problem, and I look at the, uh, the uh, um, joining with a concatenation key or, or a composite key is the number two problem. The number third biggest problem that I actually run into is people who refuse to admit that they need a calendar table in their model. And I, I don't know what it is about this particular one, but I have had so many people call me back and they're like, well, I tried to avoid it this time. Why? Well, because I didn't want to add it. Why? Well, I don't know. It just didn't feel like I should need to. Why? I don't know, man, right? Like, it gets into one of those kind of things. So the deal is, is that it's a bridge table. That's what it is. A calendar table is a specific table that's used to bridge between two different things. It just happens to be a calendar, but people don't seem to want to do this, and I'm not sure what it is. Now, the key thing that we need, I'm going to show you a really cool pattern that I actually have for building a dynamic calendar that actually expands to cover the entire boundaries of your data so that it is always up to date. How many of you do not have a proper calendar table in your organization that IT provides to you so that you can link to it. That's a really low show of hands compared to what I was expecting. Are the rest of you just feeling shy? I'm, I'm thinking, because most of the time is what I run into. Like, a lot of times, if IT is playing nice, you'll get that, but then there's a lot of cases where you're building up a model and there's just nothing there. You don't have anything. So what we're going to do is we're going to build this guy on the fly. How do we do it? Well, what we need is we need two points. We need a starting point and we need an ending point. Okay. To get the starting point, we can build this with Power Query. It works like this. The start recipe and end recipe actually work very much the same. The first thing we'll do is we'll reference the table with either the earliest date for the start date or the latest date for the end date. Um, actually, I should talk about good candidates for these. Um, the sales table is a fantastic candidate for your start date, okay? Because you're always tracking your sales. A really good candidate for your end date could be your budget table, okay? Why? Well, because generally the budget is done before you incur sales. Although you'll notice that I said generally. Does anybody here work for an organization where you budget after sales have happened? Nobody wants to admit to this? Okay. I've, I've been in an organization where we did it. The budgets didn't get approved until three months into the year, so there was no approved budget to be, to be working with. And if that happens to you, then you need to go and actually adjust your logic to think about, can I always rely on this being here? Or should I maybe bump this out an extra year just in case? All right? So just things to think about. Like, that should never happen, but then there's real world, right? Um, so once we've got these particular tables, we've referenced the one with the earliest date or end of, uh, latest date, what we're going to do is we're going to remove everything except for the dates column. So leave us just the dates column. We then filter to the earliest or latest date. That should leave us, if we're working especially with fact tables, with multiple, multiple dates that are all of the earliest one. Uh, so we'll remove the duplicates. Uh, 
it's a good idea at that point to then force your dates to either be the beginning or the end of the year. I'm not a big fan of trimmed calendar tables. It makes your DAX patterns a lot easier, in my opinion, to work with if they actually run the entire fiscal year for the data that you're actually working with. Okay? Um, I'm going to show you the transformations that give you just the standard year end, but these are easily modifiable to get into a fiscal year end, even if you're working with something like a 445 or a 454 calendar and things like that. Just take slightly different patterns to make that happen. Uh, once we've done this, uh, we change the date to, uh, to a type of date, and then we drill down. And you think, well, oh, but it's already a date. Why would you do that? Because it makes the pattern work 100% of the time. If you don't do this, there are times when you drill down into something where the pattern doesn't get it and it hard codes a date in it, and now your calendar is no longer dynamic. Uh, we've gone through several iterations of testing, and we ended up adding this step in specifically to make sure it always works. Uh, finally, we'll rename it to start date and end date, and then we load it as connection only. So I'm going to go and do these guys here. Uh, so we'll go and we'll start with my sales table. So I'm going to right click it, and I'm going to reference it. And I'm going to bigify it so you can see what's going on here. We'll just open this up. Uh, what I like to do is I actually like to rename my query right away. So I call it start date. This way I don't lose context of what I'm actually doing because sometimes my attention span is kind of short, you know. Uh, so with this, this is going to be a staging query. So I'm going to say right click, remove other columns. I'm going to filter it to be a date. And that date is going to be the earliest date. That leaves me with a few values. We'll right click, we'll remove duplicates. And then we'll say, hey, let's transform. Right now this is January 31st. so Let's go transform date, year, start of year. That'll force it back to January 1st. Force this to be a date. Right click on the cell, not the header. Right click on the cell and drill down. And this takes me into a nice little value here that says January 1st, 2019. As is represented by the standards that I've chosen for representing dates in my Windows control panel. Okay, so yours may look different depending on what you have there. The key thing is all about this in the formula bar and nobody wants to know what that means. Okay. This is giving me the first row of that previous table. But if you see a hard-coded date in here, the pattern is not dynamic. So that gives me my start date. Now I'm going to pretend I work for an organization that's always ahead of the game here. So we're going to go to budgets for my end date. Right-click, reference. We'll go and we'll move him up here, and we're going to rename this to end date. You will notice that uh, with my start date and end date, I have not put spaces in here. This is deliberate. Okay. When I'm doing this, I'm now going to say right-click. Um, we're going to remove other columns. We're going to date filter this one out to is latest. We're going to right click. We're going to remove the duplicates. We're then going to say, hey, this is March 31st. That doesn't look like a year end to me. Transform, date, year, end of year. And then force it to a date, right click, drill down, and I now have my start date and my end date. So all I need is a calendar that spans that period. Home, close and load. This will create my two new queries as connection only queries. At this point, I'm going to show you what I think is one of the coolest, most magical awesomeness patterns ever. And it's the calendar from start date to end date. Because with just these two values, I can actually give you the calendar that we need. And for Power Pivot, it's a very, very specific calendar. It needs to have a, every single row with a, repeat, with a value that goes up by one day. There can't be any gaps. Otherwise, your month to date measures, they stop at the gap when they're going backwards. It doesn't work very well. So, this is why you should never base your calendars on a fact table either, because if you're closed on Christmas Day, your month to date on December 27th is the 26th and 27th, not the entire month to date, right? So here's how the calendar works. We're going to go and we're going to create a blank query. We use this formula. It never changes. Number dot from start date. Notice there's no spaces between it. If you put a space between, it's got to be hashtag quote start space date quote, and nobody wants to type that. Uh, from there, we convert it to a table, change it to a date type, rename it, rename the table to calendar add any other dates that we want through the standard date transforms, and we load it and link it to the model. This is how we build a calendar. And by the way, after we're all done, if you'd like a nice little hard copy of this baby with my cute little data monkey on it, come ask, because I've got a bunch of them here to give away. Um, so from here, we're going to go back into Power Query, and I'm going to say, cool, let's do this. Data, get data from other sources, from blank query. I'm going to go into the formula bar. We're going to type the magic formula. This formula never, ever changes. It's number dot from start dates dot dot number dot from end dates. Close the parentheses, close the curly brackets, and boom, there we go. There's a calendar table. It looks almost awesome, except it's not a table. It's a list. So we'll convert it to a table. As fast as click possible, we just click OK. And then we call it date. And if that's not the most beautiful calendar table you've ever seen, 
then you probably want to do this, because now it is. Okay? And from there, I can say this blank query here is going to be called, double click on that, calendar. I'm going to move that up into this little area here, close and load, close and load two. We're going to load it to the data model. And now the last step here, once it's actually loaded, there it is, is I'm going to go into the data model, go to calendar date, go over to the sales dates. We're going to link calendar date to the budget's month end. We're going to right click. We're going to hide this. We're going to right click. We're going to hide this. We're going to drop back over to Excel. This is the bad timeline. That's not where it's supposed to be. So we'll delete that. We're going to just close this down because we don't need any more. Select my pivot table. Find my calendar table right over here. Right click. Add as timeline. We'll just drop this up the top right over here. The other thing I should have pointed out to you real quick, my fact tables have changed their icons. If you hide every unaggregated field in them and just have measures on the tables, they put these icons up top, so they pop those to the top so you can find them. No need to sort them. And at this point, if I go and drill into January, you'll notice it slices, February slices, March slices. There we go. There is no more relationship message needed. Everything is working. And there we go. So that's what I got for you. And on that note, I'm going to get off the stage again and hand it over to David. Your which connection? Seven. Uh, seven. Great. Thank you, Ken. Uh, as usual, this was extremely useful. I learn new stuff every time I see one of his sessions, because uh, even the alt key I didn't know. <laughs> um, a little bit of background. Uh, just like Ken, uh, Excel changed my career as well. Before uh, joining the Excel team, I was working uh, as a supply chain planner over in Surface, also at Microsoft. Um, and I was dealing with these kind of problems all the time. So I'm a huge advocate for Power Query and Power Pivot. They will like enable you to scale in ways that you cannot think possible the data that you're using it at your company uh, and the analysis that you can pull and uh, just the structure that it gives to your reports being able to export to Power BI. However, there are times in which you need to still go to the grid and run analysis in the grid. So we promised you that for this uh, best practices session, and I'm here to talk to you about dynamic arrays. Uh, just show of hands, who has heard of dynamic arrays? Okay, perfect. So uh, this will be uh, hopefully uh, useful to you, and uh, you'll be able to leverage it. So I'll go quickly through this, since uh, several of you have already seen it. Uh, up until now, Excel just understood a single value for a cell. Now, with dynamic arrays, we're able to return more than one value that spills over the uh, grid whenever we uh, use either the specific uh, array formulas or any formula that we input uh, an array as one of the input parameters. So, some of these uh, new formulas unique to this uh, feature are filter, unique, and sort, which uh, I will quickly show. And uh, you may have heard this is currently in Insiders. Uh, we expect to roll it out to general availability uh, this year, so hopefully pretty soon. And so uh, I'm going to go to my spreadsheet here. Uh, I have a table. Uh, that I want to create a summary of, and I'm going to simply going to go to unique, refer to my product, and here I have instead of a single value in the grid, I have all these values that are spilling into the grid. That was a, a, one of the new functions. Uh, I'm going to use an old function, which is some ifs. I prefer to use some ifs since I can scale it, even if I'm going to use just uh, one um, column that I want to filter by. And my sum range here is the revenue, the, the units. Uh, then my criteria range is going to be uh, the product. So I'm going to select that in the table. And the criteria that I'm going to refer to is not just a single one, but the whole uh, table. You can see this notation here, the uh, pound uh, that refers to uh, another cell that has an array formula, and we're referring to the whole uh, result of the array formula. And so when I do this, I get the whole value that scales. Uh, if I get new products, a new product line that is introduced, uh, I don't know, like uh, 
tend to, then it automatically scales and includes this data uh, in the grid. And finally, uh, I want to create a filtered version of this uh, table. So I'm going to refer to the whole table uh, here in my grid. Uh, and again, I'm going to use the filter function. So filter the whole table. What do I want to include? I want to include the region that is equal to what I'm filtering by. So here I have my whole array. Uh, I prefer to have my uh, summary tables filtered, uh, sorted by descending order. So in this case, I want to sort by revenue. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this by this uh, function into a sort. And I'm going to use the sixth column, which is my revenue descending, which is minus one. And so I have this table that scales dynamically with what I'm filtering. So in total, I'm using three functions for, uh, for this whole report. Uh, as I was mentioning, there may be cases in which Power Query, uh, you, you in your company don't, cannot connect to it, or just an easier to an easier to debug because it's easier to an easier to debug because it's easier to an easier to debug because it's easier to debug three formulas than as many formulas as rows you have. Um, and so going back to my deck, uh, in summary, it's more capable. It expands what the uh, grid can do. It's faster to build. You have to type less and just refer to your arrays and less chance of error. Uh, as well from the simplicity. And so to close this session, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about visualizations uh, just to wrap this up, this best practices. Uh, I'm going to run, well, first, know your visualizations. I'm going to run pretty quickly through the first ones since they're the more uh, traditional ones. So bar charts, they're pretty good for comparison across uh, categories. Line chart, this works really well for uh, trends over time. Uh, then we go to pie charts. Uh, this is good if you want to see the proportion among several categories. Uh, there's kind of this debate going on about uh, whether how useful they are. If you've ever tried to uh, slice a small pie into thirds, you'll know that it's not very easy to measure degrees. So uh, in general, a bar chart also works pretty well for um, just breaking down proportions and relations between different categories. Uh, we have the scatter chart. Uh, if you're looking at correlations or at dependencies between functions, you can have your dependent value on, y on one axis, your independent uh, values on the other axis, and see how this is uh, relating maybe even at a trend line uh, like I did here with the dotted line. Uh, waterfall, uh, if you're into finance, this might be pretty familiar. If you're not, uh, this shows you how an initial number transforms and ends into an end number. So this works particularly well uh, for net income. So you start with a revenue. Uh, from there, you decrease uh, the cost of sales. This gives you a subtotal, which is uh, here in a different color, the gross profit. Then you also take out the overhead cost to give you the operating profit and all the way until you get to your net income. So uh, it, it's very useful to show how uh, a number is being transformed through several stages. And this, by the way, uh, used to be really hard to do in Excel. Uh, now this kind of chart is supported natively and uh, all you need to do is point to your data and select which of your uh, different buckets are a subtotal. Uh, funnel, uh, for marketing funnels, for sales funnels, this works particularly well. Also, it used to be almost impossible to build uh, before it was added as one of the native charts. And the radar um, chart in which you can show attributes across different, for instance, in this case, we have some uh, bikes and uh, they have speed, price, rating, and weight, uh, and we're comparing uh, different models across those values, across those characteristics. Um, field map, 
This one's particularly useful if you want to show differences in values across geographies. This can be countries, states, zip codes, uh, and uh, just you point to, to your data, it will uh, match the um, region or any kind of geography that you put in uh, to, to map it. Um, and it, then you can use this for really uh, good visualizations for reports or any kind of uh, geographical data. Finally, uh, the tree map uh, really helps you if you want to show breakdowns uh, through categories and subcategories. So here we have accessories and then product. So uh, the first grouping uh, gives you the total um, quantity and then breaks it down by tires and tubes, lights and so on. Finally, uh, I just wanted to include here sparklines. Although they're not a chart themselves, uh, they are a visualization that you can include directly in the grid. They're really useful if you want to look at, at trends for multiple items. This can be a thousand products that you just want to spot uh, if you have uh, one where the trend is particularly bad. And you can add some details like the minimum and uh, some options directly. Um, in, in the sparkline option, options. So some recommendations for your charts, structure them for reusability. One of the best ways uh, is to make them a pivot chart instead of a regular chart. Uh, this ties beautifully into uh, the data model uh, and your power query. So instead of having a chart that is just uh, this values in the grid, you can use the, uh, what we were seeing previously uh, for Power Query and drag directly the measures and dimensions or the facts and, and, and dimensions. Uh, sort them, that helps a lot for readability. Uh, generally descending, because the top value gets the most attention, but if you're trying to show the opposite, ascending also helps. Uh, if you saw all the examples, they're very clean and they don't have unnecessary borders or grid lines. Uh, I know some people are fans of 3D, but stay away of it because uh, it tends to just, uh, especially for pie charts, it deforms the chart and it's even harder to read than, than a flat one. Uh, and make sure to just, uh, like in high school, your math teacher would tell you, include the legends axis uh, make sure that it's understandable that the title describes the chart correctly. Uh, if they're redundant, you don't need to do it. For instance, if you have uh, labels for each of the bars, you don't need a legend as well on the side. But uh, make sure that you're conveying what's uh, necessary without overdoing it. Um, and with this, uh, we're done with the session. All of this will be posted uh, after the conference. Uh, feel free to go and check all these resources out, uh, especially uh, all of what Ken does. He has amazing material for this and many more recipes. Yeah, the recipes that we have there, there's actually a set there that we keep up to date. Um, it's a, a subscription product as well, but uh, there's lots of different power recipes. I think we got over 40 in there. Uh, if you're interested in power query training, uh, we run a, an online power query academy. I think we have over 15 hours of material in there as well. Uh, our book, the recipe cards included, and there's actually a coupon code on there if you uh, if you want to buy by the end of this week, um, it'll save you uh, save you a hundred bucks, so um, or pretty close to it. So uh, go for that. And outside of that, if you're interested in what I do and you want to know where I am, uh, sign up for my newsletter. You find out about where that is. You also get some free ebooks, and we also uh, send out a monthly roundup on what's new in Excel and what's new in Power BI um, because these things are constantly changing. So. And outside of that, I think... Uh, we have some oh, yeah. Excel resources as well, so uh, you can go check them out. But uh, one I would call attention to is the Excel Tech community. This is a very quick link uh, where you'll find expert advice and uh, more people that are really into the product and connecting uh, with each other. We'll put announcements like the Business Application Summit and, and so on. And if you want to uh, go deeper into some of this content, uh, we have, for instance, for Dynamic Arrays, an in-depth session tomorrow, a 400-level session where we'll go hardcore into lifting and like all the array behavior that uh, wasn't clear to me until I joined the team and saw this talk from uh, Joe McDade. So thank you so much for coming, uh, and we hope to see you in some of these other sessions. Thanks.
Anybody wants one of these, come up and grab them.